It was certainly explosive and it was a documentary that leaves us all with so many questions. Joining Mike and I now is a man that's had a big battle with his son over the last four years and he'll continue to do so as Ben's loving father for a long time. A pleasure and a privilege to have you on tonight, Mr Brian Cousins. Thanks, Hamish. It's nice to be here. Uh, a very private battle has become now very, very public. Why did you choose to do that? Uh, look, it was really, I suppose, Ben's decision from the outset that he initially started documenting his recovery and then it sort of built into something much bigger than that. And when he asked the family to be involved, we did. And when I saw the end product, obviously, um, it, it, honestly, it, I felt uneasy and shocked about it. But as I you know, he always said to me, I want to tell you know the true story. And, and then I saw it and I honestly think it can create not only a better understanding, uh, I think it can encourage families to perhaps talk more openly about it when they see here's this footy player who had the world at his feet and he lost basically so many aspects of his life fell apart and, uh, and then there was the recovery aspect and I think it does show you know, young, perhaps young addicts or addicts of any age that there is a way forward. I mean he's not out of the woods by you know, a long stretch yet but he's certainly on the way but it does I think show other young people that there is a way forward. Today the feedback has been that he is not remorseful, not contrite. It was very raw part one, different part two. Can you believe the public reaction? Uh, yes and no. I, I think the issue of drugs you know, does polarise the community. I've got to be honest, seven years ago, whatever, if someone had told me a young fellow had fallen foul of drugs in a similar manner to Ben, I would have had absolutely no sympathy for him because that was how I thought. Now that I've got to understand the issue of drugs, that is a, it, is a, it is a health issue. Um, you know, addicts don't want to be addicts, they, they want to get better. And um, I just think there is a, hopefully a change in attitude to how people you know, perceive drugs after tonight. It's a harrowing tale. Was there a point at any stage when you thought, I will not see Ben alive again? Uh, without a doubt, I, I felt we were dealing with a, a life and, and death battle on, on a number of occasions and I, I honestly feel that people sitting at home tonight that are the parents or family friends of someone as an addict would probably give the same answer. It is a, it's a tough battle and, and I have the greatest admiration for, for any addict in the way they're fighting a battle because I've seen him play footy, I've seen him do lots of things but there's nothing I've admired him for more than the way he's approached this. Brian, as a fellow parent, I'm full of admiration for your work. I really enjoyed tonight's show. The bus shelter is a chilling story in more ways than one. Was that the <laughs> lowest point of the last five years? Um, in a funny way, Mike, it, it wasn't. It was on the night. It was devastating. I was, you know, highly emotional and drained. But in a way, I actually think that was a step forward because I, I went out with Ben when he he needed to use. He was frantic to to use again and. I went out with him, but I think he understood that I was on his team and he did come back home and he, he stayed at home during that recovery phase and and he certainly cleaned himself up and, and got you know, his, his recovery process back on track. And I, I do think that was it. But probably, you know, the worst moments were for me were on the times when his drug taking was at its worst, when I had to go out on a couple of occasions when he had used for a number of days and I'd get a phone call in the early hours of the morning from somebody to ask me to, you know, that Ben had asked for them to ring me to come and collect him and I, I saw this person that, um, I knew it was Ben but it, you know, he was, his eyes were back in his head like he hadn't eaten, he hadn't shaved, it looked like, you know, he was, he was down and out and um, so they were probably the worst times. I know, I know addiction is an illness, we understand that, and we understand it better now. Has, he ever, has Ben ever come to you and looked you in the face and said, I'm sorry for the pain that I've caused? Um, not in the, you know, said the word sorry. I honestly have never ex asked him to, or never expected him to. He probably did it, in, I think, in other ways, and I've always brought my kids up, actually, to say sorry is a word that I... I don't really enjoy in the English language because I think too many people say sorry and don't mean it. I've always said to my kids, you show you're sorry by how you subsequently act. If you've done something wrong, you demonstrate you're sorry by how you act. Uh, but he did, 
you know, on an occasion just prior to his comeback game with the West Coast when I met him and um, he thanked me for all the support I'd given him because he knew, he said to me, I know how much you detest drugs and he, he thanked me for the great support that I had given him. And in essence, that was, sorry, you know, in probably the most important way to me. When we saw that St Kilda had turned, turned their back on him and when it looked like they were going to take him, his quote was that it had sucked the life out of him. Richmond took him with the very last choice in the draft. There was no spot left after Richmond exercised the last choice. What do you think would have happened had Richmond not taken Ben? Um, to be perfectly honest, Mike, I, I doubt whether he'd be with us today. Um, he had set his, his, his heart on playing footy, but I think more so than that, he'd set his recovery program on getting back you know, to football. And um, if that hadn't have happened, and I think the process that he went through where clubs were saying they were going to pick him up and then they didn't, it was one hit after the other, and he rightfully or wrongfully had the view that footy had, a, had abandoned him and they didn't want him back, and he thought, well, I've done the crime and I've done the time. And it was probably one of the most, you know, dangerous is not the word, it was one of the most concerned times I felt for him. Did, did he ever get suicidal? Yes, he did. Did he talk to you about it? Yes. Um, he did, and, and again, I, I remember t speaking to our, my doctor or our family doctor, Rod Moore, because I didn't know what to do. I actually almost pretended I didn't hear it, and I said, you know, don't be stupid, or, or hardly made any response, and I spoke to our family doctor, Rod, and he said, that's not the way you deal with someone. You've got to go and address the issue and tell him how important he is to us and you don't make those decisions and you make sure you take it very seriously, which I did. And I ended up um, having a pact with him that if he ever, ever felt like that, that he would always speak to me. So is, is, isn't it funny, it's not the right word, strange though, that you're talking about that Ben and yet so many people out there think Ben Cousins is smug with a touch of arrogance and just this total belief in himself. Bulletproof is a word yes. that's been used, invincible. He's obviously not. No, he's not. A, and I think, Mike, one of the things I hope that this documentary shows is when people take drugs, it affects their brain. That's the, the part of the body that is affected by drugs. And I hope people have seen Ben in the various stages. I'm, I'm sure in some of the stages in the first episode, there are stages when he's in a withdrawal from taking drugs. He's, he's sort of angry. I mean, at the time he's been put out of foot, he's angry with the world, but he's, he's withdrawing. He wants to use drugs, but he, he knows that he can't. And they see the impact of drugs. And if they could probably compare that image of Ben through to when he perhaps made his retirement announcement where he was calm and collected, um, that's what drugs is. It affects the brain. It is a, is a health condition that affects its, uh, of, of the brain. And I hope one of the things people get out of that is this understanding, and particularly parents that deal with their children that do these absolutely horrid things uh, to them. I mean, I've heard so many times of young children stealing from loving parents, but they don't do that because they want to do it. It is the impact of the drugs. That's what it does to them. We talk about education and seeing the science. You've admitted you knew very little. When was the first time you went from thinking, I've got a charismatic rogue that may dabble, to I have a drug addict as a son? Um, Hamish, there was you know, a, a time when Ben admitted to me drug usage, but he basically almost, he didn't tell me, but he suggested I just become fully aware of how the, the world works today, that young people are a bit like when we went out after a game of footy and had a beer, that they do that, but every now and then they have a small amount of drugs and it's, it's nothing to be concerned about. Like a lot of people, I made the judgement, he was playing good footy, he was looking healthy, and perhaps at that stage that's all he was doing, and I think that continued for some time, but it was probably about you know, six to 12 months before it became public that I became aware that the problem was real serious. And did he acknowledge to you, I have a problem? Did he lie to you? No, he didn't lie to me, but he gave me, and, and I think other people that were supporting him, the view that he could, he could deal with it himself. He said, yeah, look, I know I've got a problem, but I'm on top of it. And I think 
his not so much his football performance as an ability, but I think he had a, a reputation as a, a bloke that worked hard in the game. He was single-minded about what he did, and we assumed he could use those same skills in dealing with drugs. Brian, Chris Mainwaring was a hero, a mentor, and a kindred soul with Ben. What was the impact of Chris's death on, on Ben? Uh, probably, you know, when I say indescribable, um, the bond he had with with Maney and and his wife Rani, um, they, in the time leading up to Ben's issue becoming public, they were the two close friends of Ben, that's Chris and Rani, that were heavily involved in counselling him and supporting him and encourage him in to get treatment. Rani would ring me almost weekly discussing where we both thought Ben were at and um, you know whether we should put him into rehab or encourage him. Rani was always looking up you know, rehab uh, websites all around the world and uh, sending them off to me or telling me to look them up. So the bond that he and, and Chris had was you know, it was probably as close a friendship as he had in his life. Much has been made of the AFL drugs policy, and we'll talk to Adrian Anderson later about that. To your knowledge, did Ben ever fail a drug test? I am not personally aware. I don't think he did. I'm not aware of, of him ever failing a and drug test. And what's your view about the AFL's drug policy? I mean, I suspect in one way, given it's a three-strike, we may have seen this problem earlier if it were tougher, but it's got other advantages, has it? Look, I think it has, um, Mike. Um, I, is, albeit that people may see me as a victim of perhaps an AFL drugs policy that didn't work, but I'm opposed to, to zero tolerance for a number of reasons. I think you can't make a moral judgment on something that's a health issue, number one. Secondly, the most important thing is to assess, you know, the problem. If a young lad tests positive, it could be, it could be a one-off or it could be someone that's in the early stages of spiralling out of control and it's certainly not an issue where one size fits all and it's most important the counselling process gets underway dependent on what is required for the person. So I am, I believe three is about the right number. I'm not totally familiar with what the AFL do on each of those strikes and that's probably where I, I, I probably lack the knowledge. But can, you, can you tell me how you felt when you either saw or realised that Ben had shaved his body down before the hair testing? I mean, it looked to a lot of us as if he was just thumbing his nose at the AFL. What was your reaction? I really don't think it was thumbing his nose at the AFL. I think it was something that the way that things were unfolding, he felt that everyone was out to get him, it was everyone in, in the administration of football. He had done the crime and he'd, he'd done the time and I think he was, and to be perfectly honest, there was very little feedback to him of any support or encouragement to get back. Um, I wasn't party to the decision and when he came home I, I, was, I was shocked that he did it. He had been to see um, a leading drug specialist in WA who'd suggested to him that, that, it, that the way he was doing it they could still test if they were. Um, I would think he had some concerns over, over whether he would test positive. But I think perhaps, you know, my biggest concern looking back is I'm not sh I didn't have any confidence myself that people understood the process of recovery. That the number of times I heard people talk about Ben having a relapse, mm. as if that was the end of the world. Um, you know, a relapse, and probably smoking is the best way to understand it. If somebody is a smoker and they've given up and they give up and they take it up again for two weeks and then they're clean again, that is sometime an absolutely critically positive step in recovery. Can I ask you one more? It's in the future and we're all concerned. We all hope, obviously, that it turns out well. Mad Monday at the Richmond Football Club next Monday. Alcohol and whatever they do. So I know they're much more mature about Mad Monday these days. You got any concerns about that? Um... I'd have to say, I, I couldn't say categorically I don't have any concerns. Um, I would think, you know, the girlfriends of just about every AFL player would be uneasy about Mad Monday and we'd be glad when, you know, Good Tuesday arrives. <laughs> so, no, I, look, Ben's aware that his battle is not over. He has to be careful in the way that he does things. Um, um, on the other side of the equation, he has built, I think, a, a tremendous bond with Richmond players and I know he is looking forward to, you know, enjoying, you know, if you like, a farewell 
as a player with that group. So let's hope it all ends up well. Going back to the very start, if Ben wasn't an AFL rock star, do you think he would have been a drug addict anyway? Um, that's a very difficult question, Hamish, but I, I think there is medical evidence to suggest that you can have a, a make-up where you are predisposed, if that's the right word, to addiction. And if you look through society today, and we concentrate perhaps on sports when with drugs, but uh, there are doctors, there are airline pilots, there are school teachers, there are accountants, there are financial advisors, there are solicitors that have not only probably have drug problems but have perhaps had huge drug addiction problems. So, you know, I, I think it possibly would have surfaced. We've got to take a break, but this is an email that my mother wants to ask you. <laughs> You're looking after Ben? Who's looking after you? Um, now, if I get emotional, this will be the hard one. The support crew that I, I have at home um, with my wife, Stephanie, and my son, Matthew, and my two girls, uh, without doubt, Stephanie has been the absolute strength of our unit because, as was seen on the, on the documentary, it took a massive toll on me and on Melanie, but she was the one common denominator, and I'm sure it took a massive toll, but she was the one that, that held us together. And, and also, Hamish, as a family, we've you know, had a lot of good things happen in, to us in our life, and so many families get hit with issues of all sorts of illnesses. And, and if this is the test that we've got to, we've got to deal with, well, you know, we'll deal with it you know, with all the energy and, and, and support that not only from our own family, but you know, from our network of friends. Break? Break. <laughs> Terry Wallace, Adrian Anderson, both still to come. After the break, a couple of experts talk about Ben Cousins. When you go to state league games, you'll be part of the action. You get to listen to the coaches at three-quarter time. When I was a young bloke, I think, you know, every second bloke's talking about, you know, playing in the AFL, so... It's a chance, Jack Alicia plays the tackle. Here's Cousins, 30 metres out. The first game on! Yes! Well played by Kemp. Running out of room, Cousins, brilliantly played by the youngster. Play on, the snap for goal, sensational! He becomes quite scattery, his whole body jumps, he twitches, um, and it's just, it's, it's frightening to see someone not being able to quick control themselves. Ben Cousins in a terrible state. Time for some experts' views. Michael Carr, Greg, adolescent psychologist. Great to have you in the middle. Good evening. CEO of the Drug Foundation is back, John Rogerson. Good to be back, and it's great to be back with Brian. He's answered a lot of questions. His knowledge? Oh, uh, look, it's his knowledge, but where there's great suffering, and there's been huge suffering here, there's great love. And this man and his love for his son is just, it's wonderful to see. And the message to parents around love and this issue being a health issue. There's been too much uh, rubbish said today on the radio. The shock jocks have had a field day and it's time to we treat these people as, uh, as people and, and we don't have to keep judging them. They're just people who need our support and care. Michael, addiction, is it curable or is it treatable? Look, this is a chronic, uh, relapsing condition subject to relapse and resistant to treatment and you've seen that now. I think it's about, for Ben in particular, managing this, this condition on an ongoing basis. I don't think we should talk about cure. John, we talk about the use of drugs. And I've got an email in a moment which Mike, I think you're going to be very interested in. How many Australians have tried drugs? Uh, if you look at ever in their life, yep. around 38%. Cocaine? Uh, ever in their life, 6%. 1.6% in the last 12 months. What about marijuana, perceivably the softer? Well, it's a softer, but it's the most widely used drug around 9% of Australians. I, I think the other point here, Hamish, is that since 1995, drug use in this age group of at Ben's age group, 20 to 29 year old men, has dropped 30%. So the number of users using drugs has declined. So it's, um, there are some positives here, but we still have a massive issue with illicit drugs. We can't forget the alcohol issue. It is huge in this whole story, so we need to talk about that at some point. Does alcohol fuel the drugs? Uh, there's no doubt about that, and if you talk to Adrian around the testing, uh, all bar one of the tests 
uh, positive around illicit drugs have involved huge amounts of alcohol. And the issue around drugs in our community, it's big around illicit drugs, but it's much bigger around alcohol. And that's the other message for parents. It's about role modelling strong behaviour around their use of legal drugs, tobacco, alcohol and pharmaceuticals. Brian, alcohol for Ben. Was it always the catalyst for the bender once he'd tasted drugs? Uh, well, I was never probably with him. I never understood Ben had an alcohol uh, problem, certainly in the early stages. I think as time went on and when things blew out of control with him, it would start with alcohol, he'd drop his guard, and then he would you know, move pretty quickly in, into, alcohol, uh, into illicit drugs. Michael, are there warning signs, classic warning signs for addictions? Well, there are, but what you have to understand, Mike, is that not all young people use drugs the same way, so it depends what stage they're at. Uh, there are the sort of really overt signs that many parents come to me with, like your garden hose gets shorter, suddenly the kids develop an in interest in hydroponics, mm -hmm. and you stumble <laughs> into their bedroom, you're cleaning it, and you discover drugs. But much more common are the more subtle signs, where young people, and you really do have to be the world expert on your kid to notice some of these signs, Things like uh, red eyes, uh, suddenly the kid's got a lot of visine um, and, and putting that in their eyes. You've got the psychological signs, so the depression, the withdrawal, uh, decline in academic performance. And then you get the uh, secretive communications, the new friends. Uh, these are some of the classic signs that I see. What do you think parents will feel, having watched those who have watched the documentary over two nights, will they feel it's beneficial for their kids, do you think, for their teenagers? Look, a hundred years ago, we sat around fires and we told stories, and there's huge power in the narrative. This documentary is a teachable moment. This is where we should start the conversation. We can't brush it under the carpet anymore. There's been too much of that. And as John said, we've got to stop demonising people who have an illness. Are some more susceptible to addiction than others? Genetic, physical, other? I think the interesting thing here is we, um, uh, drug use doesn't discriminate, rich or poor, young or old, uh, and we've seen a, um, one of the best athletes we've seen running around AFL for 25 years uh, uh, have this issue. And, uh, but there's so many other people in our community facing the same issue with different uh, social advantage, you know, the disadvantage, a whole range of things. So that's one of the reasons why we have to stop the demonising. Brian? the biggest lesson so far you've learnt from Ben's experience? Biggest lesson from Ben's experience, as I, I suppose as a parent, um, I mean I regret not knowing as much about it as I, I did. I think that would have alerted me to, to a lot of the warning signs. Um, and probably the other biggest lesson is when there was an issue, is I wish I had sought professional advice earlier than I did. And look, this I think is a really important point for every parent out there and every person who may have a problem or just want to talk about it. There's phone numbers right around this country that will give people one-on-one -on -one support and advice. And I know you're putting them up. If you don't want to talk to someone, there's online web services and there's also the Australian Drug Foundation Information Service and it's all online. So they, these, these people will help uh, people develop strategies to cope with their parents or just talk to people. Given you're not going to be there when your child first is offered drugs, how do you prepare them for that moment? I think you have to have the conversation. You have to use this documentary as a way to prepare them for that. What would you do? Tell them your own story. Brian, can I ask you what you see as the most critical issue for Ben from here? At the end of the football and the support that he's had around him and the disciplines in a football club, what's your biggest concern now? Oh, the biggest concern... Um well, it's, it's a, obviously a change in his, his structure. Mm. He has to, I think, work very hard to have a, a structure in his life. Um, I think he is a person, his nature is he, he throws himself headlong into everything that he's done, and that's good and bad, the, the, you know, the bad issues he unfortunately threw himself into. And I would also hope he continues the counselling that that he has had, that I, I think that's a very important issue, the ongoing counselling for him. Obviously not as extensive as he's had it when times were at their worst, but um, I think it's important he continue with that. Brian, if Ben was 10 now, how would you parent differently? Um, 
Well, I spoke at a function in the country over here 12 months ago, and probably I didn't use the, the best words, but I, I finished off by saying that I said, if there's any young parent here or any intending parent, I said, I think you are derelict in your duties as a parent if you do not have some knowledge, you know, of, of, of drugs. So I would, I would do that um, and, and just make sure, and as Michael was talking about, the warning signs. And I think, you know, when I look back, there were warning signs for me that I, I didn't realise were there. But now that I know, when I look back, they were certainly there. Mm. There's been a myriad of emails and Twitters, Mike. One for you in a moment. This one is for you. Either John or Mike, actually, now that I look at it. <laughs> How has Ben addicted to drugs when he said he didn't take them on game day or before a game? He chose when he would use drugs. That can't be classified as addicted. As if he was addicted, he'd have to use drugs and he wouldn't have control. That's from Simon Butler. Well, you, most people assume addiction is that you're using every day, two or three times, four or five times, whatever. But you can have addiction that, um, where a substance controls you, and Ben's is a classic case. He went for a month sometimes before he had the huge bender on illicit drugs. So this is where um, it really helps people understand the issues involved if they understand um, and try and break down some of these stereotypes we have around what drug use is really like. One off the Twitter. Brian, I don't know whether you're a Twitterer, but... <laughs> Brian, what would be the one thing you would tell parents of kids who experimented or taken interest in drugs? So I got, what, what would I be the one thing you would tell a parent that has a son or a daughter that's taken interest and experimented? Well, I think, you know, communication with them and, and if, you, if you can encourage them to, to speak about it, I mean... If it develops into a problem, I think one of the things you have to do is make sure that they they are aware it, it's their problem. That, that, you know, you'll support them, but they have to underst underst understand their issues. And, and I think it is honestly all about, you know, the, the education. And, and one of the things I hope this documentary does, Ben started off as a person who just experimented. I mean, his first time of taking drugs was probably with a few mates at, at school, I don't know. But it, it can develop into, you know, the issue which, you know, changed his life enormously. Michael, I suspect at some point in Brian's life he's wondered about his parenting, seeing the problem sitting in front of him. Mm. Is there a link? Is there a link between this illness and, and how you parent? There are risk factors in families. We know that the kids I don't see are the ones that generally grow up with the communication that Brian talked about, but they also feel safe, valued and really listen to and there's been a really good conversation around the family's beliefs and values and these kids are also living structured lives they're busy they've got what we call islands of competence they're involved in art music dance drama sport these are great pr protective factors look one of the other things mike is um is the shame and guilt factor uh drug drug users because they're judged harshly and their families are judged harshly as well. There's this uh, shame and guilt factor and that's the other reason why we need to s stop the judging. We need to help people recover and if we keep judging them they won't do that. And it's, it's with parents as well. I'm, I'm sure you must have felt that Brian. In fact it would be interesting just to sense yeah. your response around this. I am sure that people um, that when they became aware of Ben's issue and they were close, they did not know whether to bring it up with us, not talk about it or whatever. I, I had a couple of close friends who, who did want to talk about it and, you know, it, I actually felt good about talking about it because I, I mean, I, I was flying blind for, for quite some time, but, uh, but this way we have treated addiction and, um, it's a taboo subject and if anyone's child or family member had an illness you would offer them support if they had a if they they had a drug addict in their family you know you just you, you didn't actually even have any sympathy for them you wouldn't feel any empathy for them it's Michael, your uh, 3AW colleague Neil Mitchell expressed what I would now consider to be an ignorant view this morning mm -hmm. Will you challenge him about it? I'll certainly have a conversation with him. Um, I don't think he was the worst today. I think there were others. My mum always used to say to me that some people drink at the fountain of knowledge, others just gargle. I think there was a bit of gargling today. <laughs> Mothers are coming up a bit at the moment. How is Ben's mother? Um, she has done an, an amazing job. She's coming over on the weekend. Um, Ben's probably loves having her in Melbourne more than anyone else so you know, if she comes over she cleans and cooks but no she's um, I think she like me I think she's extremely proud of the way 
he has tackled you know, an issue. Last one, John, we're going to take a break. A question for you from the Twitter. Such is life, Ben, or such is life, Ben, at 7.com.au if you're wanting to send either a Twitter or an email. What an eye-opener. I have a question for the experts. What has rehab involved? What measures now are taken so Ben doesn't relapse? Well, I, look, I think Brian's alluded to the, the counselling and support. And if he relapses, uh, further support, rehab, whatever's required, it's, it's, if we look at the issue of giving up tobacco, tough, tough issue for anyone. And we need to be patient and support this guy. He needs our care and our love. And we as a community need to provide him with that. Mike, that email I was talking about is still coming. Don't worry about it. John, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Michael, pleasure to have you in. Thank you. On the other side of the break, uh, Terry Wallace. He threw Ben the lifeline. He's an important part of Ben's life. He's up next. He's been everywhere, Cousins, in this term. 52 metres out. Pets for home. There's still length in that kit. He's floating on air, Ben Cousins. The winner of the 2005 Brownlow medal... It's Ben Cousins, the West Coast Eagle. It's all about, uh, you know, a grand final and winning a premiership. I decided or, or knew that the only way out of this chaos and mess was to get back to training, to get fit, and to rely on the structure and foundation that football provided. Just look at the players, look at the emotion in all that. As we get a year further away from that shitstorm, I have even greater appreciation for the role that Richmond have played in my life. And I say my life, because not my career, it's my life. Welcome back to Such Is Life, Brian Cousins, our special guest tonight with Mike Sheen on the end, two very special guests in the middle. Firstly, Terry Wallace, the former coach of Ben Cousins. Great to have you on, Terry. Hi, Mish. How are you going? Yeah, very well. It's been a big couple of days. Yeah, look, it has been. I mean, it's all been built around this and uh, you know, plenty, of, uh, plenty of media attention to it all, but uh, I just hope people get a you know, proper understanding of where it's been and, uh, and the journey. Sitting next to Terry Wallace, the CEO of the Richmond Football Club, Brendan Gar. Great to have you on. Pleasure, Hamish. Brian, I want you to repeat what you said earlier. If the Richmond Football Club didn't pick up Ben Cousins. Where do you think he'd be now? Yeah, well, I, I, know, I honestly believe you know it would be gravely doubtful whether he would be with us today. Terry, when you selected Ben, the last man in the draft, did you have any idea of the significance of what you were doing? Yeah, well, look, I mean, there's a couple of parts of this. I mean, first up, uh, our, my knowledge and uh, I think even the club's knowledge of, of uh, the drug intake and, and the whole scenario of it, uh, uh, we weren't, um, you know, well enough versed to be able to sort of say where it was going to end. But uh, certainly uh, I had to put a submission to the board and there was a few parts of that were obviously about the marketing and, and all those, the nicer, the nicer bits. But uh, the last conversation we had, uh, the last word that add to the board uh, before we went was the human side of things which was the fifth point and the last thing I said to the board was if we step away from this and we had no obligation uh, if we step away from this uh, I believe that there's a likelihood that something will go wrong within the next three to six months and could the board uh, with that decision at hand uh, lay, lay their heads on the pillow at night and be able to sleep comfortably if somebody who was a, a great of our game uh, did something tragically wrong. Brendan, you were at the Players Association as Chief Executive at the time. You're now the Brisbane uh, Chief Ex the Ri the Richmond, Richmond, Richmond Chief I Executive. Yeah. <laughs> Had you been at Richmond, would you have uh, endorsed the move to take Ben? Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, at the, uh, the Players Association were very supportive of, of Ben's... Um, well, what we see is his right to play AFL football again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, let's not forget he was a wonderful footballer mm -hmm. and uh, he still had enormous value to add to any side. And uh, and uh, you know, I think we lobbied and, and uh, very hard for him to be given that opportunity. And uh, behind the scenes, we're so thankful that Richmond did give him the opportunity. And, and as a former player, um, um, many years ago, I was very proud of the leadership at the time who made that decision. And, yeah, had I been in the, in the, uh, the shoes, uh, I would have done the same thing. Now, his father believes if he had a full pre-season in the, in the upcoming summer, he could play his best season at Richmond. Were you, uh, what did you feel when, he's, when the, the question of his future came up? Were you keen for him to play on or did you think the time um, was right? It's funny, I, I mean, I had a couple of chats with, with Brian over the last few weeks and, um, and, uh, and you know, I talked with Ben as well, but ultimately it was a football decision and a football decision very much involving Ben 
And, uh, and I think the football department, you know, Craig Cameron, Damien Hardwick, etc., were, were open to him playing. Um, but I think the more, um, the more you know, they considered it and the Ben considered it, um, the more he thought it was right to go out in a high. And I think he's, um, he's worked very hard to get himself in a, a position where he can go on to you know, the next stage of his life. Brennan, you're CEO of the Richmond Football Club. What is the biggest issue of employing a drug addict? Um, well, it, 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 you know, it obviously it takes a lot of work, but you know, as far as we're concerned, um, you know, an addiction is an illness, and um, you know, a lot of people go to work every day with illnesses, and a lot of people, you know, the law and, and medicine, etc. And so, uh, you know, I think I think part of the decision at the time made by the club um, was whether you know there were support structures were in place, and, and I think when you you know seeing the documentary the last couple of nights, I think you know the wonderful family and, and Brian and Stephanie and the experts around him and, and I guess with the structures the club had in place and Terry would have been familiar with those, I think, you know, the club was confidence and ability to, you know, support Ben. And it's manageable? It's easy enough if you've got the structures in place? Oh, uh, well, you know, you've got... A lot of CEOs around the place concerned now. Can you help yeah, them? Yeah, but look, look I, think, I think our, our industry, our football industry, philosophically, um, you, know, and you know, I think we know a lot more about drugs and uh, we're all a lot more informed and I think philosophically... I think there's a view that you know the best you can do is to to include, to support, um, and to educate, to inform, and communicate, rather than you know alienating and punishing. And uh, you know, if it's all the informed view, and Michael Carr agreed, and etc. So that's the way to deal with addiction. And, and I think as an industry, I think we're much more informed. Terry, the timing, as always, seems to be perfect. You knew the yeah. hair test was a giveaway. You needed to do it anyway. Yeah, look, uh, there's a couple of sides of that. I think uh, in the documentary, Ben uh, mentioned that uh, he probably would have been better off to uh, to lie and uh, perhaps just sort of say everything was okay. Uh, we had done our due diligence along the way. Where we knew exactly what was going on with Collingwood and where that whole scenario with the investigation was going. If Ben came to us and told us lies about where he'd been and, and where he, his state of play was, which included you know, shaving his head, uh, we would have had to cut the ties at that stage. We just needed him to be honest so that we knew what we were dealing with. We didn't care about what had happened prior. What we wanted to know is when he stepped in the doors at Punt Road, uh, would he do the right thing? Ben's honesty, Brian, has almost brought him undone a couple of times, hasn't it? I, w I would think so. He's always, um, I think, been pretty upfront about his issue. Um, how he's dealt with it is probably the thing I, I admire about him uh, the most. Um, I know he did have a concern, and this is prior to you know Richmond giving him the lifeline that perhaps you know, and it was what was written in the media, but perhaps you know people didn't understand the the issue of drugs. Uh, the number of times I had people contact me and say, look, so and so's not interested anymore because he'd relapsed. And um, whether he had or not, I don't think people understood relapse. And if I could just speak probably more generally and specifically about Ben, that, you know, a relapse is so much can be a part of, of someone's recovery. And I think I've used the example earlier tonight about smoking. It, it can be an essential part of, of the recovery, but people were saying, oh, if he's relapsed, that's, that's the end of him. But Brendan, I've expressed some misgivings about Ben's and Richmond's version of events with the caffeine tablets and the sleeping pills. Are you totally happy with uh, um, with the published version of what actually happened? I, I, I am, Mike. We have no reason to doubt otherwise, and um, and we relied on on the version of events that were provided to us, and and you know the the, the people in the hospital, and um, and uh, so you know, absolutely satisfied from that point of view. Terry, Ben's famous quote: "Idle hands are the devil's tools." You've left two clubs and I assume you've had a lot of idle time as a result. Do you fear for what Ben is going to experience in the next few weeks? Look, it's, it's not a good time for anyone to be going through that, P particularly, I mean, this industry is so publicly profiled and then you step away from that. I, you know, I'm a couple of decades older than him and I went through my own uh, yep. times, nothing to do, nothing uh, near what, uh, you know, where Ben's been, but uh, certainly it's a difficult time. If, if I had any advice for Ben, it is get yourself occupied and get yourself busy that you, you just haven't got that time because close yourself in and something's going to give somewhere along the line. You, uh, you know, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a, a gambling addiction because you've got extra time, whether it's a, a drinking problem, whether it's uh, the, you know, the drug scenario that Ben's been through, just keep yourself busy. Brendan, what, what lessons do we learn from the Ben Cousins uh, chapter? And 
on a broader sense, do you believe there's a problem in the AFL with players and drugs? Before, Brendan, you asked that. Well, oh, you've got an email for me. This, this is, <laughs> yeah. is going to get this away, but it is also for all of you. And Terry, great to have you here for this as well. I can't believe you guys keep saying how much of a problem it was at West Coast. It is a massive problem at every club. It always will be, and you guys don't get out and see the scene these days. It's terrible. That's from Josh. Well, look, two things about that. Uh, that. Because it's a massive problem doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't a big problem at West Coast. So I'm still sticking to that story. But I agree. I mean, I've had four kids go through their 20s and into their 30s now, and they thought I was extremely naive. The great thing about what we've done in the last 48 hours is that this is going to enlighten a lot of people. Yeah. And it's going to have us debating with experts about the problem. And... Hence my question to you, A, is it a problem, and B, what lessons do we learn? Well, I'll, I'll answer the last first, but, but I think, I think uh, you know, as footballers, they're, they're put up in pedestals and uh, they're invincible and that's a perception. But I think, uh, you know, what Ben highlights is uh, human beings, you know, we're all dealing with our problems, we've all got faults and shortcomings and, uh, and vulnerabilities, and, uh, and clearly addiction's one of those. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I think full credit to Ben, I just thought he's... I guess willingness to, to sort of persevere and, um, and and to keep trying and you know the game and competing and the love of family and you, know, you just don't give up you know and that's the great lesson you just don't give up and you don't give up on on anyone and, and as far as the, the, the broader issue um, look I, I don't you know when I was at the players association um, you know anecdotally I was hearing some disturbing things around 2004 2005 ac across the board and uh, um, and that was probably reflective of general society. Um, I was supportive of the introduction of illicit drug policy. Um, that's one of the things I was proudest of uh, in my time there, and I think that's led to a, uh, a reduction in drug use, and I think it's been instructive broadly. Um, um, and I, as I think John mentioned before, you know, drug use and, uh, has reduced. Terry, do you think there's a problem with the AFL players more so than society? Well, look, I mean, first up, all you can do as a, as a senior coach is study the group as they come to training each and every each and every day and sort of see whether you know how you sort of feel that they are and you know I've never had a real issue in uh, in looking at, at my players but the one thing that I would say is that from when Ben started and uh, Adrian will probably speak about this more but from when Ben started uh, the testing regimes have gone up in my five years as coaching Richmond from where it started where it was a shock if you actually saw a, a drug testing agent come into your uh, into your football club I mean they were just a welcome part of the furniture by the end of it they were there every three and four days and that's not only in the scenario of Ben I mean obviously he was getting tested three four times a week but uh, it just became it just ramped up uh, a heck of a lot more than what it was certainly five to ten years ago. Terry did you have any apprehension that you were bringing an addict to the club and the disease or the drug use may spread? No, I didn't, uh, because we had had uh, a lot of conversation with Ben about where he was at and, and what he um, and what he did. Uh, he was more uh, a loner in that uh, that factor of it, particularly coming to Melbourne and particularly not knowing uh, you know the guys at the club. He's got to know them very very well now. But uh, I, look, I didn't have that as an issue. I mean, I, we had a lot of issues about could he get his way through it, but uh, certainly uh, that was never ever a, a worry for us. Brendan, do you think that the football industry? should engage Ben, and I don't mean to be good blokes and, and just sort of um, try to sort of nurse him, but, but is, has he got a role to, to serve with the AFL or with a particular club, do you think? Look, ultimately that's up to Ben, Mike, and you know, I think Ben's an addict and he's still dealing um, you know, with his own issues and that's and, um, and, you know, going to be a challenge, it's particularly as he transitions out of football, but uh, you know, I guess having regard to his experience, you know, he's extremely bright. Um, intelligent, articulate, uh, charismatic. I think he'd be a tremendous um, asset to the industry, um, to society, if he wanted to do it and if it was a meaningful role. And there's been a lot said about let's keep Ben involved in footy, but I think, uh, you know, I think it's got to be a really meaningful mm. role and ultimately it's got to be up to him. Time for a break. Brendan, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Amish. Please. Terry, well done. Thanks, Amish. After the break, Adrian Anderson. How did he beat the system? Well, we'll find out. A standing ovation for Ben Cousins. Haven't seen that too many times, but after 15 weeks of absence, Ben is back. Cousins immediately back into the heart of things, putting McVeigh under pressure, holding the ball. Cousins finds a way, as he so often does. The Eagles win, but it's another classic, and Ben Cousins' comeback will be remembered as long as football is played in the West.
AFL expected me to come across um, in a way that gave the or a perception that I was cured, that all my problems had been solved by this year off. Right through this process, I haven't bullshitted about my condition. To say, you know, I'm still an addict, I'll always be an addict, is not what they wanted to hear. Welcome back to Such Is Life. Ben's father, Brian, is our special guest tonight with Mike Sheen. And joining us now, Adrian Anderson, Football Operations Manager. Great to have you, Adrian. Thanks, Harry. The obvious question first. If Ben had been using since 1996 as a 17-year-old, how did he not get caught? Yeah, well, look, firstly, um, I think the most relevant thing is the fact that he didn't turn up to training when their drug testers were there in early 2007 led to his first rehabilitation. So um, the system did actually flush out the issue and uh, was constructive in that regard. Secondly, Ben admitted, I think, in the first episode that he started taking drugs 1996, 17 year old at school. The AFL's illicit drug policy didn't commence until 2005, 2005, 2006, you know, some 10 years after um, this issue had started. So um, we were the first sport at the time to undertake out of competition testing for illicit drugs. We've always had testing match day like every other sport, you know, take cocaine match day, you're out for two years. But we were the first sport to introduce testing out of competition in Feb 05. Within two years, that uh, issue had been flushed out. And I think you know, importantly as well, we were learning as well. You know, we did about 450 tests the first year and we subsequently revised, we do triple the number of tests, we've targeted recovery sessions, we've introduced hair testing and we've got a lot better of at it and we continue to learn. So hopefully a young Ben Cousins coming into the system today uh, would be detected and helped because that's the purpose of the policy. The question a lot of people have is why does the AFL have an illicit drug policy? Dentists don't, lawyers don't, financial institutions don't, but it's saved a few lives. Yeah, we believe we've got an obligation to look after our players. I mean, they're taken from all around the country at the age of uh, 18 because they're good at footy. And, uh, we, and they've put in an environment, as, we, as we've seen with Ben, where they're getting a reasonable pay and, um, you know, they, they have some of the trappings of success at a young age. So we think we've got a real responsibility uh, to their health and welfare to try and look out for them. And to the players' credit, I think enormous credit, to be the first sportsman in the country to say, yes, and Brendan talked about it before, yes, we are happy to be tested when no one else isn't out of competition for illicit drugs. Huge step and um, one that's now being followed uh, overseas to a, to a large extent. Adrian, were you too slow heeding the warning bells from Perth about Ben and about his football club? Look, I mean, I think um, as as Brian said, you know, one of, uh, and I must say on behalf of everyone at the AFL, uh, the huge admiration we have for the love and support Brian's given to, to Ben is just uh, outstanding. Um, and as Brian said that, uh, you know, in hindsight, you, you, you could have seen some of the warning signs, you, you know, you'd love to have uh, been alert to things quicker, but I think, um, you know, we shouldn't forget that it was a huge step for the AFL to undertake to, and the players to undertake, to have testing out of competition begin in 05. And if that hadn't happened, I'm not sure that the problem would have been flushed out in 07 when he failed to turn up to training. Gee, there, was a lot of there. there was a lot of speculation about the problem in Perth. A heap of we all knew it. The people mm. in, the, in, the, in the media knew about it. It just seemed yeah. to us that you didn't want to act. It was sort of 2,000 miles away and let's leave it there and, and, and hope it goes away. Yeah, well, we did act, Mike. I think that's the really important no, thing I'm talking here. about in the first, ha first half of the decade. Yeah, well, look, I mean, it's hard for me to, to um, reflect going back that far in time. For, from the period I've been involved, and this is you know, one year after starting, the AFL undertook, with the players' support, to test players out of competition for illicit drugs. A huge step. There's still only three sports in the country that are doing it. And I think that was a really positive step, and even in the isolated example of Ben's case, hopefully led to him getting support earlier rather than later. Brian, we've spoken about this a little. Zero tolerance versus the three-strike policy. How important is the three-strike to you and to Ben now? Uh, look, I really endorse Adrian's comments uh, in regard to, to the policy in general, and, and I am a, a supporter of a three-strikes policy for no other reason. This is about, you know, I mean, education and detection and 
and particularly if, if a, a player does uh, test positive, that he is thoroughly assessed to determine you know, where he's at and appropriate programs you know, are put in place to, to give that person the best opportunity of a recovery. I really don't fully understand the extent of what a zero tolerance policy of when they're, whether they're just, they're named, they're shamed and they're put out for whatever period of time. But um, I think doing that is making a, a moral judgment of what I think is a, a really uh, important health issue. A lot of emails and Twitters have come in tonight on the subject of the Eagles Premiership. Was it tainted? Ben said he didn't. Have you had a separate conversation with Ben about using cocaine on match day, which Adrian is a performance enhancing drug if it's taken on match day? No, I, well, I've, he's, I mean, I saw in the documentary what he said. I, I have never been aware of him, you know, taking drugs. Um, I mean, leading up to, you know, this becoming public, I, I was never aware of him taking drugs, you know, in, in a part of a football season. You know, I mean, I, when I've seen the documentary and he's told me about it, how, you know, he used to have his periods of a time and when they, they he had an opportunity to have a, a weekend, he did, but I am not aware of any time that he took so it. So he did speak about when he had the opportunity in a gap and he thought he could escape the testing? He'd abuse that or use that or...? Yeah, I, I think that they, they learnt that if they played on a Friday night and then the following Friday night and then perhaps they didn't play the following Sunday and they got a weekend off, that they would target that period of time and think, well, that's a weekend that we can we can uh, use. Adrian, when, when Ben shaved down, did that jeopardise his chances of being reinstated? Absolutely. Um, it caused some real concern. Um, and I think to the Commission's eternal credit, I mean, they knew, uh, and as Brian talked about, you know, that relapse can be part of recovery. They knew that, obviously, that uh, something was amiss in him doing that. But based on medical advice, as we've followed all the way along, were prepared to give him that opportunity based on what the doctors told us was the best thing for him and that it was appropriate at that time uh, to give him that opportunity. He, a he, brave decision. Yeah, well, yeah. But particularly when um, Ben actually had the view and he expressed the view in the documentary that he thought yeah. you guys were out to get him. Yeah, look, I, I think I'm not sure Ben will ever understand uh, the extent to which the AFL medical officers and the AFL generally has really gone out on a limb to endeavour to support him and provide him with an opportunity that hopefully uh, for the long term is to his uh, long term benefit. Brian, do you think it was a big risk on the AFL's behalf to allow Ben to be re-registered, but even before a club took him on? Look, obviously there was a, a risk involved, but I think the, uh, this comes back to the core issue of someone that is a is a, an addict. Um, if if he well, actually, perhaps had another illness or, or some other problem, and he was in any other industry. He was a carpenter or, or whatever. I would have thought the the appropriate uh, workforce body that was, would would look after that particular uh, work work would encourage that person to get back into the safest and best environment, which would be part of their their recovery process. And I think we have to take drugs out of a a separate you know category and and treat it. In a, in, a, in, a, in a manner which we would look at, at other, you know, problems. It just appears drugs is just put in, in one issue. You know, I, I, I think the AFL handled it, you know, in a manner which they, they gave him the opportunity to come back and, and, and I, I hope this is looked on as a very positive uh, uh, program that they did and in years to come that other players will perhaps benefit, you know, from this experience. Adrian, I want to show you a bit of commentary now. Patrick Smith, one of the leading journalists <coughs> in this country, was in the documentary. I want to ask you how he can be accurate or no after this. And the AFL was seen to be really sensitive and fuzzy on this issue. Then when the problem didn't resolve itself, and then when Ben gets arrested in the middle of Perth, the AFL just simply said, we've got to cut this bloke. We've got this reputation. We've got a three-strike policy on drugs, and here's a bloke who hasn't tested positive once, absolutely killing our image. And when you kill the AFL image, they kill you. Patrick Smith, great journalist, generally pretty accurate. I want to know how he could be so adamant that Ben had no strike next to his name, because isn't it a very confidential process? Yeah, look, the only people who know if there's a positive are the player 
and the AFL and club uh, medical officers. But on the other point that uh, is being referred to there, you know, it's not well understood that the Commission, even in suspending uh, Ben for 12 months, uh, as it was at the time, well, that was in accordance with the medical advice at the time as what was in his best interest, just as it was in accordance with the medical advice later on to say it is now the right time to give him another crack. So I think that um, the AFL, the Commission, has been true to the objective of the health and welfare of players as the fundamental objective of the policy, and that's why the players support it, because they see that. They've seen the number of positives now a quarter what it was when we started the illicit drugs policy in 2005. You know, you heard Terry talk about how much more the testers are out at the club, how they're out their recoveries and how we're now doing hair testing. So, you know, we've listened to the experts very closely on what we should be doing and we're seeing some great results and we'll continue to learn and con continue to try to get better at dealing with this very difficult issue. Hamish, I'm equally adamant that Ben Cousins did test positive in 2007 when the drug testers finally caught up with a couple of people that they wanted to test at West Coast. So I can't claim unequivocally that that's correct, but I am as strong as Patrick in the, the opposite view. And, and I, I should say, I think a bit of the confusion around this issue has come because you, you asked Brian before about, you know, cocaine match day. Um, Asada came out and confirmed that they had tested Ben numerous occasions on match days, including in big finals, and every result had been negative. So in some circles that then became, oh, he's never tested positive. But there's two separate policies, the match day one, which every sport has got, and the out of competition one, which uh, is, is uh, peculiar to the AFL and now a couple of other sports in Australia. Do you think the drug policy in the public arena has got uh, the credibility that it should have? Uh, I don't think it's quite got the understanding yet. It should have, Mike, but I think every year, you know, we've been very transparent about it. We publish our results each year and usually get a little bit of a whack at the same time. Um, but we believe that what we're doing is right and we've been true to the objective of the health and welfare of players and, and, and it's working. So, you know, we think uh, we're on the right track. We'll continue to listen to the experts, but it's such a difficult and emotive uh, issue that um, it's bound to divide opinions and, you know, we have to expect, uh, expect that. Adrian, thank you for coming in and good luck for the rest of the year. Thanks very much. Adrian Anderson, time for a break. When we come back, we talk about Ben Cousins' future. Cousins left standing. Here's trouble for the Blues. 35 metres out, gets his third. Cousins, here's danger. Still with Cousins. Fantastic stuff there from Cousins. Don't tell me, Ben Cousins, you're a star. I think idle hands are the devil's tools and, you know, I found myself, you know, having a drink and then I think having a drink and then getting getting back to my old ways uh, for a month, I think. Um, and you can do a fair bit of damage in a month. The final chapter of Ben Cousins' football career concludes on Sunday afternoon. You can catch it on 7. John Rogerson comes back in to answer some questions uh, that we can't. Mike, nice so to have you back, John. Can I just make a comment? Uh, just to, about the word addict. We keep using the word addict, and uh, it's a judgmental term. I reckon we're better off saying that uh, Ben's a person with a drug problem or a person with a health problem. But, but, but we'll Ben actually calls himself an addict. I, so would I, you counsel him to sort of desist? I, I would. I think it's just part of how we label people. It, that's part of the stigma. I understand that. Yeah. And I, yeah. But Ben was sort of has almost been boldly saying it. Yeah. Uh, and I think because and he, says he doesn't want to hide anything. No, no, and that's what people want to hear. And I guess this is part of our journey forward around this whole issue is let's have some really good conversations and um, we can deal with this issue like we do dealt with mental health and get it much more positive than what it is. Brian, Ben has a drug problem and he has a, a disease. Idle hands are the devil's tools, he said it. On Monday, how do you keep Ben very busy? Oh, we've, through him and, and uh, several people who've wanted to be involved in ben, Ben's future, he does have some, some work opportunities coming up that um, are going to keep him extremely busy. So, you know, he's been very part very much an important part of the process, knowing that going forward he has to 
um, occupy himself. Um, he needs something that's going to hopefully develop into a business passion for him and uh, through the support of a couple of pretty um, good guys from Perth, that, that opportunity is there for him. He was a straight-A student, went to university. What, did, what are his interests? Um, well, I don't think he has anything specific, specific in mind. Um, so he's got to go and obviously find in the work uh, position that I think he'll take up, which I probably don't want to disclose too much detail, but uh, there's a fellow who has a business network which cre has a number of various businesses and I think he's going to involve Ben in each one of them for a, a period of time uh, with the view of one of them you know, becoming a real interest to Ben because I think he, you know, his nature is that if he gets really involved in something he will become very passionate and, and, and work at it very responsibly and actively. Do you think he'll stay in Melbourne? Uh, for certainly in the short term and I think he'd like to stay here for the long term. John, Brian is looking after Ben. We touched on it earlier. How important is it for Brian and the family and Steph and all of the family to have help? Uh, look, it's critical for anyone uh, who's, uh, who knows someone who's got a, um, a drug problem that um, the person with the problem needs support. There's lots of support available for these people, but we need to help people understand where to get that. So it's on the phone systems, it's on the web, but it's also just as critical for the parents, for the family, and uh, there's all this guilt and shame, and we need to get over that and support these people deal with this issue. John, what's the lesson for the authorities to take out of this? The lesson for the authorities, um, look, we're dealing with people. We're dealing with people with a health problem and let's support them, let's care for them and we've seen no greater care than this person beside me. Mm -hmm. Like just outstanding love and care and his whole family, his two daughters, his other son and his wife, just outstanding stuff. Brian, we're going to wrap things up shortly. A couple more questions. One, you have an opportunity to send a message to every parent and every potential user in Australia. What would you like to say? Oh, I think to every parent to really try and, and understand this issue and um, I really enjoyed the comments of John to take the, the stigma out of, of drugs and, and understand it is a health condition, uh, to talk openly about it. For young people, I hope the message they got from Ben's documentary is for them to understand that you go down that path of the, you know, the destruction to your, your own life that can occur. And, but very importantly, there is a way out. Uh, it's a hard road, but it's, uh, there is a way out of it. And I suppose one of the things that I've, my main involvement is obviously since Ben became subject to his, uh, his problem is to young people to, to really think about how they're gonna go about their lives and uh, they get a lot of education about what they should do to avoid uh, taking drugs. But I'd also encourage them, whatever is the opposite of peer pressure to, uh, parents play a big role, it's very important the parents talk, but I think it's very important the young people perhaps talk it amongst themselves and they should be the ones that are encouraging each other to make sure that they, they stay out of issues that can have a damaging effect on their lives. You know him very well, he said he was your best mate and vice versa in his press conference, where will he be in two years time? Um, yeah, I have, have great faith in him, I, I said somewhere recently, uh, I've had great enjoyment of watching him do a number of things through his, his life as he's grown up but there's there's nothing I've admired him for more than the way that he has had to deal with you know what I think is probably the toughest issue anyone can deal with in their life you can get an illness that you you know unfortunately takes toll of you that you can't do anything about you you can control this one you can get on top of it but it's this tougher thing and and I, I just admire him the way he's taken the fight up. Brian, you know uh, we couldn't have a session without a hypothetical. Would St Kilda have won the flag in, <laughs> in 2009 had they honoured their, or followed through with their, uh, their plan to draft Ben? I am probably not in a position to, <laughs> to yes, answer that, are. but I, I probably would like to say one thing. You know, the regret that I have from the footy clubs that approach Ben is, to my knowledge, not one of them took a, a drug counsellor or a, a counsellor knowledgeable in this issue you know they came over to speak to Ben he was honest to my knowledge he was very honest with him and, and probably that honesty may have cost him a role I also heard that sponsors you know threatened to, to leave a club and it's probably one thing I have res great respect for the AFL that you know they have a 
I understand a wide range of educational programs for you know their players, not only in the issue of illicit drugs, but in, in alcohol and you know the treatment of women and gambling and things. And you know, if that was the case with sponsors, I, I would just hope they might relook at it. Those sponsors that perhaps did and say, "Hang on, there's there's a lot more to this issue than us just saying, oh, we don't want this person there because they're affected by drugs." I would have hoped that they would look at it and say, "We would encourage our club." to give this person a chance and we want to be part of that process. So you're referring to St Kilda? St Kilda was the club where the sponsors uh, imposed uh, their will? Look, I can't remember back, Mike. I, I was aware there was a number of clubs, but I would then hear news reports that, you know, that various clubs... I, I think that was a, a case for a number of clubs. Last one. Will he <laughs> play on Sunday? Ah, <laughs> uh, now, th that's a difficult one. Um, uh, I, no, I honestly believe it's only 50-50, but if there's any way possible, yeah, I would think the Richmond Footy Club and he will make sure... They've got those buggies now, Brian. You can <laughs> take him on the ground on one of those. <laughs> You'll be there? I'll be there. My wife and my uh, daughters and son will all be there. Thank you, Mike, for coming on. Wonderful Pleasure, to have Hamish. You. Uh, Real, I said it before, Brian, but I think on behalf of... If I can speak for the footy community, we all admire what you've done. No, I appreciate this. I appreciate the support we've had from not only the footy community, but from uh, people. And, and the greatest support I've honestly had, Mike, and it's interesting you know, having John here, the greatest support I've had has been from people I've never met that have come up to me and they've had to deal with a family member who's gone through what we've gone through and they are the ones that understand it. And I just hope that what this does is make sure those people that haven't gone through it have the understanding that, you know, that people have that have gone through it because it's something I think it'll touch us all, you know, whether it's, you know, in years to come, you'll have someone you know that goes through it and we just need to make sure we, we approach it in a different way we have in the past. John, thank you for your time, information and education. Uh, yeah, if I can just comment about uh, this man next to me. Just fantastic. I want to talk about his son. Just what he's done. He's put it out there rawly, but he's helped a lot of people, and we need to really thank Ben for that. Uh, it's fantastic. Brian, thank you. Wonderful yeah. to have you on, and yeah. good luck Cheers. for the rest of the battle. Brian Cousins, hope you enjoyed tonight. Ben's response will be with Sandy Roberts tomorrow night on 7 News. If you have any doubts about yourself or your friends or your family, please go to adf.org.au. Hope you enjoyed tonight. Have a good evening. Bye for now. I'd like to announce my retirement. What a goal! Unbelievable! I am forever indebted to the footy club for the opportunity to, to play football again. The winner of the 2005 Brownlow medal is Ben Cousins, the West Coast Eagles. The only way out of this chaos and mess was to get back to training and to rely on the structure and foundation that football provided. By walking away from the game now, I can walk away in a positive light. Don't tell me, Ben Cousins, you're a star!